um, we're going to stay on this theme of revolutionary living. All right? <laughs> so if you want to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel according to John. It was read in your hearing this morning by Brother Bill. We thank him for that. But I am an advocate that it's always helpful for us to give scripture more than once. So we're going to read it again. Read the Bible. All right. Let's go. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. John chapter 2, start reading at verse 1. John chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have the wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there are six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, which hold 20 or 30 gallons, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. Then the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and the disciples believed in him. This is the word of God by us, the people of God. Can you say thanks be to God? Thanks be to God. It's about the word of prayer. God, in this moment, we ask that you center us enough to hear your voice. God, silence all of the thoughts that are going through our minds at this moment. God, such that we may receive fully from you. That we might be changed and transformed because of your word today. May we walk away from here changed and different. So God, impart your word to us and allow us to consume it in a way that it walks in truth with us for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So throughout history, as we've been talking about revolutionary living, we're going to talk a little bit today about revolutionary change, or for some it may be more better described as revolutionary power. But throughout history, right, we've been talking about all the things that revolutions do, right? So we look all the way back to 1905, the century's first um, big push against autocratic power was in Russia as an Orthodox priest gathered 150,000 workers to walk the icy streets of Russia. And they succeeded in that nonviolent civil act, right? Which led to Russia's first like popularly elected um, parliament. We see it happening with Gandhi in the 1930s in India against the British rule, right? He led the people against um, paying money towards salt taxes and buying clothing, right? And they won their independence. And it just carries on throughout the century. I mean, from um, the Philippines to South Africa to my alma mater, four students from North Carolina A&T State University. Aggie Bryant. <laughs> <laughs> that in here. Who started the civil rights movement, right? It was present at the Berlin Wall when it came down. So what we have are these revolutions that are existing in our world. Because when systems and sin collide, they create breaks in relationships, right? And those relationships have to be mended. So revolutions rise up in order to restore things back to their intended order, right? That's what we've been talking about for the last few weeks. How do we live our lives in such a way that we are revolutionary restorers to God's proper order, right? At the heart of every revolution, is a family. Yes. When we think family, we usually think people descended from the same ancestors. 
That's family, right? Blood relation, right? But there is something about family that goes beyond blood, at least human blood, right? Or our bloodlines. That's why people talk about meeting their soulmate, right? This person whose intellect, whose mind, whose way just kind of intertwines, right, with their own. Now, as I told them this morning, I'm not making a claim for whether or not soulmates exist. And my husband was here this morning, so if y'all talk to him, just let him know I said again today that I do think I married my soulmate. <laughs> but pass that word on, okay? <laughs> I'm not making a claim as to whether or not that exists, but I do know that God has blessed marriage in such a way that two people who, generally speaking, don't have a blood relation, right? <laughs> That's the country of me. I'm from Yanceville, y'all. I know some stories, all right? <laughs> that they have the deepest form of human relationship. So family goes beyond bloodline, right? Just even in the process of marriage, right? So if we look at relation, relation can also mean um, relation as in how we connect, how we understand our minds, right? How we connect to people, right? We relate to someone. That best describes a friend. Right? Someone who gets us, who understands us, an advocate, and an ally. So friends are undoubtedly family. I would even argue that some of you have friends that you feel like are more your family. There's a goal you really can't to, right? Mm -hmm. You call them your sister, right? I have a lot of people I call sisters, and I mean that to my core, because that's who they are to me, right? My brother, that's who they are to me. And we are all descended from a people who combine family and friends into one combination of community that is designed to empower us to live this life as God intended, right? Science has told us that the origin of humanity began in the land of Africa, right? And if you look at African peoples, no matter who you are, where you're from, spiritually or physically, you are descended from a people who have at their core that community and family is how we exist in this world as human beings. At the core of every revolution is a family. But family is not the only revolutionaries of this world. The greatest revolutionary maybe in existence was a man by the name of Jesus of that was born in the little town of Bethlehem to the Virgin Mary, her husband Joseph, and he grew up in this place called Nazareth. And in our text today, he finds himself about three and a half miles away from Nazareth at a small town wedding in Canaan. He has already invited his disciples to walk with him, so they're there hanging out. His mother Mary is there, so I'm assuming that this is probably a family of friends. A friend of the family, a family of the friend, a friend of the family, all right? And they're at this wedding. So Jesus is not, you know, prominent in this time. Like, he doesn't walk in and somebody knows him as Jesus, the one, the miracle worker, right? Like, nobody knows Jesus. Jesus is chilling with his homies, like none of them. He came to a wedding, he came to the party, and he brought people to the party. All right? So he said, Jesus actually that person be like, are you serious? Like, you didn't just, I invited you and you brought all your boys, really? You brought 12 people? <laughs> so Jesus brings 12 people to this wedding and he's hanging out and Mary is there. Now, weddings and during this time lasted for seven days. Now, that's the way to do a wedding, y'all. Make it last for seven days. All that money you spend, just make it last for seven days. <laughs> And people came every day, new people came every day to the wedding, just, just full of festivities and lots of celebration, okay? So they're there at this wedding and people are having a good time, both drunk, they just all over the place, right? And Mary, the mother of Jesus, discovers that the hosts are about to give out a wine. And this is a humiliating prospect, right? For you to be hosting a party for people and guests and you're about to give out a wine. Now, mind you, the text says that some of these people were already drunk. Can you imagine drunk folk who expect to drink more, finding out that you are about to give out a wine? So it's not only humiliating, but this thing can get real ugly real quick, right? So Mary, who's the only one who knows who Jesus is, comes to Jesus and she says, hey, Jesus, yes, mama. <laughs> they about to give out a wine. 
uh, okay? <laughs> what they got to do with you? That ain't your business. That ain't my business. My time has not arrived. Mary ignores Jesus. She turns to the servant. She's like, mm -hmm. look, whatever he tell y'all to do, y'all do it. Right? That's what mama's do, though, right? They just ignore what you say. No, I got this. You are not about to have the power to help these people and not gonna help them. That's what she's saying to me, right? Whatever Jesus knows, you can change it, and you change it. Jesus, mind you, young people, listen, does not question his mama. <laughs> he don't argue with her, right? He already said his piece. What that got to do with me and you? And she answered it. It got everything to do. You about to change the situation. <laughs> So even in this moment, we see how our connectedness to family also guides our life in such a way that it helps to manifest who we are supposed to be. Jesus says, okay, take those six stone pots. Each of the pots held 20 to 30 gallons of water that were used for washing your hands before you ate. Okay? He says, fill them to the rim. The servants took it, they fill it to the rim. He says, now draw some out. Can you imagine what they are seeing as they draw what they thought was water out and now all of a sudden it looks like wine, mm. right? And I mean, they are probably relieved. Can you imagine what a servant feels like if they got to run out of wine and all these people are here, right? So they are relieved and they're like, oh my goodness. He's like, okay, now take it to the steward of the festivities. Now the steward or the master of the wedding was either the head servant or someone they had chosen to oversee the festivities of the wedding. So they take it to whoever is over the wedding and he tastes this wine. He was like, man, this is like the best stuff to slice bread, right? Okay, not slice bread because they didn't have sliced bread back then, but this is the best thing that I've ever tasted, right? And so he goes and he calls the groom over. He's like, man, you know, most people serve all their best wine first. And then after people get drunk and they don't know any better, they serve their inferior wine, but you have saved the best for that. And the scripture says that this became the first miracle of Jesus at Canaan that started his journey, right, towards the cross. And the disciples believed in him. They believed him. Now, at the core of this passage is change. Jesus changes water to wine, right? The lives of those who have witnessed this miracle are changed forever as they are invited into a different kind of life, a different way of thinking, a different sense of possibility. And even the people there, the whole spirit of the place is changed now that there is wine like they've never tasted before. It just changes the whole spirit of the place. So change is in the air, but everybody does not experience the change. There are three groups of people here. The first group is pretty much Mary. She's by herself. She's the only person there who knew before coming to this wedding who Jesus was. She knew what he was capable of. She knew what he was called to do. And she wanted everybody to benefit from his power. The second group are the servants and the disciples. Right? These are the ones who witnessed this miracle. These are the ones who did not know who Jesus was before, but now after seeing it, are like, man, this dude is more than just a man, right? So they are that group of people who are invited into discipleship, are invited into this journey of possibility. But then there is the third group. And it's good to know that this is the largest group. The majority of the people at this wedding are drunk, out of their mind, totally unaware that the greatest power known to humanity is sitting a few feet away. Come on, come on. Even the bridegroom does not ask about this mysteriously superb wine. And he's supposed to be the one in charge of wine. They are oblivious to this change. They benefit from the change, but they don't experience the change. Now this isn't what the sermon is about, but I just had to mention it because I think it's relevant for us to really process and understand 
And just because change is taking place in a space, it does not mean that everyone experiences that change. That everyone is acknowledged by that change. People, yeah, people get it, they benefit from it, but they don't have any connection as to what it took to get it, right? Or what it mean for their lives. All right? So change, we're dealing with change. Christ is entering in in this moment a revolutionary power that will change the world forever. In this moment, in this small town of Canaan. Now in the Old Testament, the abundance of wine represents the entrance of, of God's joyful new age, right? But we also know that wine also represents the blood of Jesus, right? And we'll get to that a little later. Right? But this joyful new age is literally what Jesus is entering in. And he is saying, I am carving out revolutionaries right here and right now to embrace this power in order for the whole world to be changed. They're on the precipice of some monumental stuff. Right? Now, salvation, we've been talking about revolutions as circular, right? As coming back towards our intended place. Salvation is a restoration of a proper relationship with God, right? So salvation is that process, right? Through which we are able to come back into proper relationship to God, right? And so there is this salvific revolution that is being introduced here that we've been talking about, right? But we also know that that salvation, that, that kind of power and energy also permeates beyond our spiritual life. It permeates into our actual living and how we live out this world, which is why we see civil rights movements, which is why we see people rising up against injustices, right? Because salvation isn't just in one pocket of our life. It is intended to consume us in such a way that we live our lives from this place, right? Everything that we do is consumed by this revolution of salvation, of what it means to be in proper relationship with God and other people. So who were the revolutionaries Jesus was carving out? They were the servants and his disciples, right? They were the ones who witnessed why and what Jesus did, right? And they had two qualities in common. One, they were prepared to take a risk. How do we know? Well, the disciples had already taken a risk. This is the first time they've ever seen Jesus perform a miracle, but they had already left their families, their jobs, their lives, as they knew it in order, in order to follow this man named Jesus. They took a risk to follow Jesus. The second thing, right, that we know, well, is that they had faith, right? I think anybody who sees Jesus do what Jesus did would probably have faith in this moment. Now, the servants took a risk because Generally speaking, people of humble background understand what it means to serve Jesus in a radical way. They have a lot less to lose because they know what their life depends on, right? But furthermore, when they drew out that, that wine that was once water, they had no idea what that stuff tasted like, right? And they took the risk of taking that to the steward. They were willing to take risks. Faith and courage are married together. Okay? If we say that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, then that means that you have to be able to trust blindly in a way that requires courage. Because faith without works is dead. So we can say we have faith, but we have to actually take, have the courage to step out on that faith and do something, right? In order for that faith to have its proper work. Right? So courage without faith is dangerous, but courage with faith is the only way faith exists. And if we remove courage from faith, faith is dead. All right? So they have these two things, these two crucial things in order to walk this journey with Christ. But Christ was doing more. He was giving them access to a power that would literally change people's lives, would really, would literally create a sense of freedom. All right, so we're working with revolutionary change. And if we draw from physics today, all right, change means to transform, all right? And to transform means to shift from one energy or power to an entirely different energy 
or power. All right? Now, theorists have begun to work with this concept of human power. Right? They're tapping into the fact that humans have a certain power that's innate in us. Right? And they came up, I read an article a few years ago, came up with three forms of power. The first form of power is coercive power. All right? So I coerce you into doing what I want you to do through manipulation, persuasion, or by withholding something that you need that I got. Right? Okay. So, for example, I once knew, uh, there was a story that I recall about two sisters, all right? An older sister and a younger sister. A younger sister, um, an older sister on the bus, and the younger sister says a curse word. And the older sister says, oh, I'm going to tell. No, please don't tell, don't tell, don't tell. Okay, I ain't going to tell, but you, you got to do X, Y, and Z, right? So the older sister realizes that she can really hold this power over her younger sister's head for a long time. This thing goes on for the better part of a year. I mean, every time the younger sister went through what the older sister says, I'm going to tell Danny about you cussing like this. <laughs> and poof, it would just happen. She would do it. Right? It goes on and on and on until one day, about a year later, they're in a room next to the kitchen. Their dad is cooking in the kitchen. And he overhears the older sister say, I'm going to tell Danny what you did on the door. And so the daddy comes to the door and he says, you're going to tell daddy what? <laughs> now the younger sister is panicking because she's like, oh, what I've dreaded for a whole year is now upon me, right? I'm going to get in trouble because daddy going to find out I cussed on the bus. The older sister is like, man, I can't hold this over her hand no more because when she tells daddy, she doesn't have that power anymore, right? And so she says, you know, she cussed on the bus. He was like, she cussed on the bus. When did she cuss on the bus? Younger sister said, about a year ago. He said, a year ago? Are you serious? And he lights up into his oldest daughter. I mean, he just goes off on her. And the lesson that they learned was that in that family, manipulation and coercion is not acceptable in loving relationships. Right? Now, kids do this all the time. And we laugh and we think it's funny. You know, if you don't do it, I'm going to tell. Right? Kids do it all the time. But when you put this thing on a larger platform, it becomes blackmail. And it has the power to literally break apart and dismantle families and nations. It has as its root greed and narcissism. The second form of power is exchange power. Exchange power is you have something, I have something that you need, but in order to get it, you have to give me something that I want that you have. Now, people make fair and even exchanges every day, right? That's fine. But when you were add to the word exchange, the word power, that implies that, there, that one person has an unfair advantage over the other. All right? So a few years ago in this movie called Set It Off, starring <laughs> Queen Latifah and Jada Pinkett Smith, right? Jada's character was a, was a young adult who was raising her um, teenage brother, right? They lived in, in the hood, and so they, you know, she wanted him to get off the street. She wanted him to go to college. Like she had worked her whole adult life to make sure that he got away from this community, right? So she's trying to find out how in the world she can get enough money to send him to college because her job isn't paying her enough money. She looks at all these avenues, and finally she ends up before this man who is a man of means in the community, right? And he says to her, fine, I got the money. But in order for her to get the money, she has to have sex with him, right? She has to sleep with him, right? So she struggles with it a little bit, but eventually she does it, right? And this is what we call exchange power. You unfairly demand of someone something that they have that, because you have something that they need, to withhold something that they need, right? And so you can only get it for something unfair. Right? This is something that really gets to the core of breaking the human spirit. Right? It can literally break the human spirit. This is what we see happening right now, dare I say, in American healthcare yeah. and pharmaceuticals. Yeah. Something that people need, but in exchange, what you're asking for is too great for something that they need. Right? It's exchange power. The third kind of power is the power that we're really trying to get to. This is called integrated power. Okay? Integrative power. This is 
the capacity to get what you need and want in concert with other people. And the folk who were writing this article said that this is actually the most powerful form of power, human power, right? Because it actually speaks to the most basic element of human life, right? That there is something about um, human, human organization that is both dynamic, right, and organic. Meaning that the whole, right, can surpass the sum of its individual parts. So our, all of the people in this room, every sense of power that you have in yourself individually, if we added up all those powers, right, on a calculator, it would reach one sum. But when you put all of us together in a room and we are combining that power together, it actually escalates and surpasses the sum that we would get if we added up each individual piece of power. Right? Now this is some God stuff. Right? This is something about how God has created us. This is what's happening in civil rights movements where only a small percentage of the people can invoke change for the majority of the people. In our passage, think about it. It was a small nucleus of the people, right? Who knew about the change. It was a small nucleus of people that God sent out to harness this kind of power, right? So what we're talking about here is integrated power. This is what Jesus was presenting. But Jesus was presenting it in a way such that he could teach the disciples what was already in them from creation. How do we know that? Let's go to another scripture. Genesis. If you want to join me, you can. If not, I'm going to read it for you. Genesis chapter 11. This is something that we don't tap into and we haven't tapped into that we missed reading this passage of scripture over and over again. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them for them. And they had brick for stone and by the boot men for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad the earth and the whole face of earth. Verse 5. Key. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the mortals had built. And the Lord said, look, they are one people and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing. Nothing. Let me say it again. <laughs> nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over all the face of the earth. Now, the last part of this passage is what we usually pull from this passage. This is where we find out how people got different languages, right? But what we miss is the fact that Jesus, that God says, along with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, because he says we, right, let us go down. That's just a sidebar. Okay, let me, let me just stick to the point. All right. <laughs> I digress. But what he says is that they speak one language, right? And they have one purpose. They are one people. And that there is nothing that they, are, they will propose to do that will be impossible for them. Now, mind you, God does not change their capacity to accomplish the impossible if they are speaking one language and are on one accord. All he does is confuses their language because they were using it for the wrong thing. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that people who still speak the same language and are on one accord lose the capacity to, to um, reach the impossible. This is something I call a universal truth. It is woven into how God has created us. It doesn't change. It's a part of our human genetics. Right? There is a power that God has given us that Jesus is tapping into this few 
of his disciples in this passage that says, no, there is a power within you that if you join that power with others who are of like mind and of like heart, despite your differences, if you allow this purpose to be higher than your differences, then there is nothing too impossible for you to achieve. This is huge stuff. This is stuff we've been overlooking. Now again, this is something that I feel like is innate in us, and I feel like people misuse this every day. I think people who can't even articulate why they have the power to do this for other people misuse it every day. We see it in gang activity, right? Why are gangs so hard to break apart? Yes, it's steeped in something that is that is dark and broken, right? But they tapped into something that is innate in them. They they join together around one purpose. I don't care if it's death, right? right? I don't care if it's survival, right? And why is it so hard to break that? Because they have tapped into something that we who should be teaching it seem to not have been able to tap into. Come on, yes. right? Come on, come on, back. People do it on levels of politics, yes. right? They do it on political levels and principalities and high places. They get it. Mm -hmm. We the ones that need to get it, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Think about it. Jesus took twelve men. Really, it came down to eleven out the Jews, right? He took eleven men and harnessed this power in such a way, right? that we are still preaching the same gospel 2,000 years plus later. Think about it. Over 2,000 years, a message of one man who was also fully divine. That's the power. There are some things that we can get done if we are able to use the power that God has given us, if we are able to be in community with each other, if we're able to join together around one purpose together, there is something that God will do. Here at The Way, we're not just about becoming a mega church. That's not what we feel like our call is. Don't get me wrong, if that's some people's call, it's not a problem. What we feel like our call is, is as God increased our numbers, we are equip equipping people, right, to go out, right, and free other people and allow them to acknowledge the power that God has given them. To help free other people and acknowledge the power that God has given them. To go help free other people. Yes. That's the paradigm that we use here. If you want to know more about it, come to the new members lab. <laughs> right? So there's this understanding that we become free, right? By harnessing this power of salvation, right? This power to work in concert with how God created us to be, such that other people may know that, that Jesus did not just die, but he conquered the cross. Yeah. He lives again, yes. right? This is the, the community, and this thing permeates more than just what we're doing here at church. This is a concept that is true for all human existence. So you need to be taking this kind of power into your work, on your job into your family. Let it guide the way that you pray to God. God, can you just join me with like-minded people? Yes. Can you give us a heart for what you're calling us to do? And then can you help us be reminded that you have promised that nothing we put our hearts to as long as it's in the right intention is impossible for us to achieve. You can do a whole lot in this world. We are falling, our communities are falling apart because we don't know what our power is. This revolutionary change, this power, and this transformation is at this core right here. And it is at this core that Jesus says, I want you to come together as my people to let other people know that they can be free. Yes. To let other people know that there is another narrative, another story. That there are possibilities beyond what you think is impossible. Mm -hmm. There are heights that we have not reached because we have not harnessed what God has given us. We have not lived out our salvation in a way that says that God can free all people. God can heal all people. God can cover all people. God can raise all people. Yes. 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 We haven't lived our lives in that way. That's what this call is for. God is saying if you would just harness this power long enough, I promise you that justice will run down like the waters and righteousness like a mighty stream, that you shall be like trees planted by the river who bring forth their fruit in due season, right? Whose leaves do not wither, but whatsoever they do shall what? Prosper. Come on. This is what we're talking about, 
God. We cannot buy into this individualized understanding of Americanized Christianity and thought patterns. Do I matter as an individual? Absolutely. God sees me. But I matter a whole lot more in community. You can't walk this thing by yourself. that we're going to today. Yes, yes. It's a lot of confusion around community. Right? But let me explain to you that this power that we've been talking about, this power to connect to one another in order to overcome the brokenness of this world, in order to spread the freedom of Christ, right? In order to even be healed in our own body. Other people help us heal, right? That's how Jesus has organized it, right? It's found at the table that we're going to today. The body and the blood of Christ says to us that we can conquer the material things of this world because we are connected to the one who created them, yes. who can transcend them. When we come to the table, it's not just about us individually. There is a grace that exists through the power of the Holy Spirit in those elements that not only forgives us of our sins and heals us, but it binds us spiritually and eternally to everybody who believes in Jesus Christ. Not just the people in this room, but the people down the street, the people in this state, this country, and this world. We are bound in that moment by the grace of the Holy Spirit in order to conquer and shake up, as Michael McBride would say, this world. So when we come up to this table, it's not about being perfect. If we had to be perfect before we came to the table, y'all, we would never have communion because nobody would be able to take it. Right? That table is not about perfection. It's about grace. Yes. Yeah. So don't deny yourself the opportunity to commune with God and God's people in the most intimate way through the unction of the Spirit at the table. Because you feel like you haven't gotten it together. That's why we will have a moment of repentance today. What does repentance mean? Repentance means a desire to turn back towards God. It means a desire for that gap that sin has created between us and God. Right? Be closed. It doesn't mean that you can see how you're going to get there. Right? It doesn't mean that you become perfect because you ask for it. It doesn't even mean that you fully forgive folk in your heart in that moment. It just means that you have a desire to. Come on. Right? And you're saying, God, I have a desire to be better. I have a desire to be closer to you. And I am saying, God, I know this is wrong about me, and so I'm asking you to just take it. Yes. And then you come to the table and you receive the grace of the Holy Spirit to cover those things, to begin to move you towards what it means to forgive people who hurt you. To move towards what it means to forgive people who have done you wrong. To forgive of that addiction. So we come as broken people to a table in order to be restored. Yes. Not individually, but collectively as a body. And in that grace, in that healing, in that restoration, God grants a power that allows us to show other people that they can have this too. That they don't have to live their lives in hopelessness. They don't have to live their lives in isolation and in death. But that there is another story. And that, that story is so incredibly powerful that there is nothing, nothing they can do or encounter that will separate them from the love of God. That's what we got on our minds. Then we got to start yelling like the babies back there. <laughs> Because this is good news. <laughs> so take a moment, take a moment and, and close your eyes as we prepare to go to the table.